You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for March 19th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the world headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where watching Trumpers pull up to the bank drive through to cash their Biden checks has replaced bird watching. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Look, Drift Glass, it's a red billed Trumper. Yeah. Oh, Look, look, honey, it's a it's a truck nut lunatic. And they're all cashing their Biden money and going to the diner to complain about socialism. Isn't that great? Socialism. That's Isn't right. That's just great. You know, turn, give that money back. Turn it around. Burn that check. Don't cash it. That's that, that's tainted. That's socialist <laughs> money. That's red money. Don't spend that. No, 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 no. No, I'm I'm grateful that that money went out and went out yeah. to everybody because yeah. then you can't complain about those people having it. Oh, yes, you can. Because you cash yours, except oh, they yes. will. Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> well, and that sort of gets us, um, well, first to our, our, we'd like to welcome you all to Sunshine Week. Happy Sunshine Week, everyone. Happy Sunshine where, Week. Tell me what that is. Where we celebrate uh, open government and transparency and the First Amendment, you know, stuff that we kind of dream about that you yes. know, often never actually happens, uh, but it you should. You mean like Freedom of Information Act and stuff like that? Freedom. Freedom, freedom to talk, know what your government's doing and why it's doing it, uh, and so on and so forth, which again is, is a a mighty um, aspirational goal to have, and it should be celebrated. Uh, it is almost never actually achieved, but it is something that we should aspire to. Well, and I noticed this week that Crew, that is the Citizens for Ethics and Responsibility in Washington, uh-huh. said they will not rest until they get to the bottom of everything that happened in the Trump administration. Wow. Okay. Went, Nothing like job security, buddies. Yeah. yeah, for your for your children and grandchildren. Yeah, that's, Right. That's... And they're really and and I'm grateful for them. You know, I'm too. very grateful that they're doing that. I try to promote their work on Twitter whenever I can. Uh and I uh, I also wanted to um let you know Drip Glass, I did some math and uh this is episode 590. Oh no. If my math is correct, in 10 weeks it'll be episode 600. Ooh. And that is Memorial Day weekend. So oh my God. I suggest we start thinking about a letter show. We should do a letter show for that long weekend. Yeah, but planning ahead really isn't my thing. So <laughs> I'll know. do it. Yeah, she'll do it. <laughs> she'll, of course, of course he will, but, darling. But hey, no. Drake this was a really good week, it, I think, it was. again. It was the again. second in a row. We're just, you know, back to back good weeks. I don't know what to do other than knock on all the wood I can find. And yeah, you know, I so mean, on. it wasn't a good week in Atlanta, and and no, we do no. we do want to talk about that and and the the racism and misogyny and plus guns, plus let's face it, white privilege in law enforcement, yeah, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Um, I do recommend, uh, you know. This is this is a podcast that doesn't always go into mass shootings, p- partly because I can't talk about it um, without getting really emotional. Uh, I do recommend going over to Comedy Central of all places and listening to the Daily Show and and them covering this story. Uh, Trevor Noah did a remarkable job, and if I could, I would just clip that and put it in our podcast, but. Uh, you know that well, that that would get Comedy Central very mad at me. Yeah, we're, we're so. already being sued by enough people, so you know why add Comedy <laughs> so, Central? So yeah, but but I recommend you go and look at that. Um, but but aside from that story, um, and of course people still passing away from COVID, um, we are looking on the bright side of a hundred million shots have been given, and yep. shots in arms is going to lead us out of this pandemic. Yep. Uh, we are grateful that our son, Junior Dude, got his shot this week. Uh, he waited it at uh, his local pharmacy three three evenings in a row, right? Uh, seeing if he could get a leftover shot, and the third day he did. So mm-hmm. grateful like, for that. Just like Jesus, honey. Just On like the third Jesus. Day, you know, uh, we're looking forward. We're talking about getting our Sunday school group back together in person instead of on Zoom sometime in the next yeah. few weeks. Uh, my knitting group. Uh, all of whom have had at least one shot, and and most of them are over sixty five. But um, all of them seem to have had at least one shot, mm-hmm. and uh, we're going to make plans to uh, have our June meeting in person, which isn't too far away. Time no. moves very fast. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, there there are good things happening, and I'm uh, grateful for that. Uh, on the very high end of the spectrum, this it's a hundred million shots, forty some odd days sooner than expected. Uh, beat the sooner deadline. Sooner than promised. Yeah, yeah. promised. So you know you. You under promise and over deliver. That's how you, you know, that's how you do things in life. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and, and they are delivering on their promises at, far ahead of schedule. And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, it was rainy and cold and kind of yeah. miserable here this week. And to, to get our week started, uh, Blue Gal's power adapter for her ancient laptop, uh, exploded. Well, it didn't quite explode. It, it sparked it and sparked. it smoked. And yeah. I, all of a sudden I could smell electric smoke, uh, um, said, hey. which was not a good smell. No, can you can you spell that? Yep, yep, and yep. <laughs> it was uh, it was the it was the electrically taped adapter that had already right. been you know it had already cracked once, and I had put electric tape around it, and then it just said, "Oh no, we're not doing this anymore." And so you know, and the, the word "hero" is often overused. Drift but glass I, was my hero. I did get in the car and drive to a place and walked in, the in rain. boldly in the rain. <laughs> in the rain, this is like a Hemingway story. Uphill both ways. <laughs> there were cats along the route, and I I drove through the rain. Um, because my woman needed something and mm-hmm. I got the amazing universal all purpose Wi-Fi enabled, <laughs> um, it slices, it dices adapter with 900 tips and one of them's going to fit. Cause it says on the box, this will fit everything. Don't worry about it. It's, it's a universal. And of course it didn't, it didn't uh, at home. It, and I, I laughed with a the guy there who said, you're very tall and I'm not. And that seems, that's a very awkward thing to say. I don't know how to respond to that. Other than you're right, and you're right, I'll, I am I'll, tall, and you're not. If yes. this goddamn adapter doesn't work, I'll be back to hurt you very badly. <laughs> um, and I was back to hurt him very badly. Uh, no, no, they were very. You didn't nice hurt about, anybody, but, but we were was, we were not surprised that the no, nine tips in this box that says none of them fit my laptop. Specifically says, and it, it'll fit your brand of laptop. Did not fit your brand. of It laptop. said you looked up my brand it on is. the side of the box, and it said that, and it still didn't fit. So didn't we had fit. to go. We had to go local uh-huh, to the did. local shop. And we went Fortunately, to Fortunately, you were able to return the the universal adapter yeah. and we walked up to the door of the local shop with uh, you had a good description of that shop. Yeah, it's but. it's kind of like a the, the, the curiosity shop. It's there's uh-huh. it's a little troll that lives in there. Go away. And yeah. uh it's it's full of old stuff. Old it's a fly spec counter. It's you know, it's it's not a terrible place, but it is definitely um was once a barber shop, I can tell you. Yeah. That. Yeah, and yeah. It, and, and I'll have and, to check in the back and see if I'll I've got your back. Back. Yeah. And it's um, you know, and he whisked us away from the door because you know apparently they have it's, it's more than mask restrictions. They were not taking any customers. And he no, came out and it's said, just "Yeah, small in there. It's it was just like Harry Potter's where Harry Potter bought his wand. That's what yes. that store looks like, yes. except it, computer equipment. Yeah. And he came and he back. Had one. Oh yeah, yeah. He got one. And and this is the virtue of, you know, I. Not, this was my brain back when I ran the tech department at Columbia College, which was, mm-hmm. um, I know where everything is. I know where all the old <laughs> shit is. I've been here, I, I'm here 12 hours a day, six days a week, and I rebuilt the place. So I know exactly where everything is. And yes, mm-hmm. I'm sure I've got one way in the back. And he came back and we did. And that's more of a story than he probably wanted. But it it was an unexpected delight. That within, and it is why you can listen to this podcast today because I have a power cord for exactly, my laptop. So exactly, see, and, tying it all together, <laughs> tying it all together. Yeah, I'm missing one control button on my yeah. keyboard, but otherwise it's working fine. Yeah, and no one needs to tell me to get a Mac. I know, no. I know, I've heard no. that. I've heard that from my entire Crooks and Liars staff. That why don't you just get a Mac? It's a one cord for everything. Like, no, nah, I'm not yeah. going to do that uh, right now. Uh, 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 maybe, uh, maybe later. I like I like spending small amounts of money on computer yes. equipment. Is my thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but hey, uh, I am grateful to my husband for pers- being bravely. persistent, bravely persistent I, in well, making sure I get my power cord. Well, you, you had know? to, as as it's an ancient phrase, it's a gardening phrase. To, you had to husband your battery very carefully. You had to preserve yeah, the did. 3% that was left. And had I had to shut see, it down. Yeah. I could see after the, as the hours ticked by that you were starting to lose your mind. Um, so, <laughs> I was. I, thought, I was. Because you know, this is, this is my job. It's my mm-hmm. podcast. It's everything. So mm-hmm. if you can't, if it starts getting down below 30% and giving you warnings and so mm-hmm. forth, it's like, oh my gosh, what am I, I going to do? you know, would you like to use my computer? And you said, are you insane? Yeah, I don't want so, to use your computer. I want my computer. It's not for lefties, first of all. And right. Bad? So, okay, I know that voice. And I'm going to go find some stuff. I'll be I'll I drive want to, my computer. Yeah, Thank I'll you. drive to Peoria if I have to, but I will right. find a cord. Well, and we were talking about, you know, we're, we're going to have to 
spend spend stimulus money on a new laptop if I can't get a power cord for this old thing. So, mm-hmm. but it worked out. It worked out, and thank you. And that's the end of our uh, podcast. We hope you no, uh, thank no. you for joining us. No, but you see, good news uh, is is bad for the media business. It is. It is, um, yep. especially conservative media and the mainstream media, which is why. Your crazy Uncle Liberty is not hearing about 100 million shots or Junior Dude getting his shot nope. or my wife getting her power cord or, or the, the legitimately good, interesting, um, positive, light at the end of tunnel kind of stories. You know, the, yeah. the people being appointed at the cabinet and the, the, the voting rights stuff that's coming up in front of Congress and the legitimate debate we're having over the filibuster. They're hearing about immigration caravans, scare yeah, talk right. 24-7 on Fox News. The, the And the, the caravans are back. And, you know, this is just... They've so got you one could page. set your watch by when this would happen, yeah. that scary brown people crossing the border. Yeah. And, you know, President Stupid going on Maria Bartiroma on the phone and claiming and the, at the top of the interview, I I didn't know this except mm-hmm. for how Sparks talked about it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> saying at the top of the interview that he, he had finished the wall. <laughs> yeah, almost. Four feet. Four feet to go, Maria. And we just had four for the feet to go. To get in and out. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was only for the trucks to get in and out. That's mm-hmm. the only part of the wall that isn't That's completely it. finished. 3,000 miles. Perfect. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's all done. Except for four feet. The goddamn liberals kicked us out of it. I, can I say goddamn on your show? And it's, it's, and well, it's just a complete, and she just sat there. With her yeah, giant bar inflatable, over. you know, yeah, lips no. and the bug-eyed face going, yes, Mr. President, that's wonderful. You're right. And you realize that, you know, this is this is life over there on that planet. Yeah. This yeah, is what yeah. your crazy Uncle Liberty is listening to every day and believing as the gospel. We want to talk a little bit about the filibuster, too. Right. So Mitch McConnell's trying to grind Senate business to a halt if Democrats try to stop him from grinding Senate business yeah. to a halt. Yeah. And And his, you know... Oh, I'm going to do a scorched earth policy on every piece of legislation you've ever proposed. And I, I saw Chuck Schumer go, we've had eight years of that. We've right. had 12 years of that. What? What, what are you talking about? You <laughs> burned everything. And it, it really is when you've spent all of your ammunition, right? When M- Mitch McConnell has really uh, has no threats left. Well, when when you fired all the ammo and you th- you're throwing pieces of the gun now because you yeah, have nothing yeah. left to fire. Yeah. And and it's cuz he doesn't have anything else. There's no. nothing there's nothing left for them to say or do or propose. It's well, and just, he's pro- what he's proposing is I'll I'll have my wish list and all his wish list is I'm going to give everybody covid again right. and force them force them to work for slave wages and and pollute the air some more and it's like okay well, and, and, dude and lindsey because there's a one-two punch mitch mcconnell yeah. threatens to grind the senate to a halt and mitch and lindsey graham promises to hold his breath till he turns blue he's going to mm-hmm. filibuster mm-hmm. until he falls over and every single person on liberal twitter was like can we get that on pay-per-view pay-per-view man I'll pay 30 bucks to see lindsey graham talk until he passes out and hits his head on the podium as he falls to the floor <laughs> i will pay real honestly on stimulus money i will spend uh, my stimulus check to see that and it, it is like again threaten me with a good time lindsey that's that's really great. good really, for you um really and so one of the things that we have been doing to deal with being on lockdown and and this sort of flat circle of time that Republicans mm-hmm. never change and the way the mainstream media treats Republicans never changes is we have um, – because we write and read about politics all week long. Guess what we did in bed this week to relieve the pressure and tension <laughs> All of those TMI, things. You know, <laughs> you know, usually we don't talk about our secret lives. You know, the, 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 we'll tell you about Junior Dude and, and the kids and college and stuff. But the, the good stuff, the, the after dark stuff, we don't share with you. But this Waka week, Jawaka. we're going to make a special yeah. exception. Uh, we snuggle up in bed. Yes, and we, we did. <laughs> we analyzed Anton Chekhov. <laughs> Anton Chekhov. That's what we did. <laughs> Which was a ball. Which is an absolute gas. Well, um, let me let me back up and explain how we got to okay, okay. analyzing Chekhov in bed because right. it's a story. <laughs> I, I want to um, call this section textual healing. So, <laughs> so just bear with me on this. And this does have a relation to politics. So really I want does. you to understand yeah. we will be dovetailing back to politics in in this whole podcast. But uh, last week I talked about my newfound love for BookTube, which is people talking mostly about new books on YouTube. <laughs> And there are whole channels devoted to this. You know, people, publishers send these folks books and they talk about them and whether they've read them and 
and then they have book chats and so forth. And it is just, to me, an addictive thing to watch. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite booktubers is this uh, guy from England named Simon Savage, S-A-V-I-D-G-E. He and two of his buddies, uh, a friend known on Instagram as Tom Reads Books, and uh, the other buddy is Simon Savage's own mother, and her name is <laughs> Louise, and she's a classics academic. So she is really, you know, well-read and has a lot of very interesting and erudite things to say about books. So the three of them host a seasonal book reading virtual event. Uh, they call it Book High Bear Nation, B-E-A-R, High Bear Nation. They do it every season, four times a year, it appears. Um, and they're just getting ready to do their spring book break. And it is a time to read a bunch of books and talk about them. But mm -hmm. what kind of cool about it is they provide you with a series of prompts for choosing what to read. Mm -hmm. And for the spring, the prompts are, oh, by the way, it runs uh, this year from March 26th to April 4th. Uh, they'll be doing a bunch of things on YouTube and Instagram and so forth, discussing different books and uh, coming up with ideas and so forth about the different kind of books that people read. And so there are prompts for picking books. And this retreat's prompts are, uh, number one, read a novella. Number two, read a book with the word weather or a type of weather in the title. Number three, read something funny or read a comedy. Number four, Four, read a book with the color yellow on the cover. So it's it's got actually the color yellow somewhere in the artwork on the cover. Uh, number five, read a book with five words in the title. And then they have chosen a book, and they always choose a book that meets every criterion uh, of all of those prompts. Mm -hmm. And uh, the group read of all the same book this time is a book called Cheerful Weather for the Wedding. So it's got the word weather in it. There's The color yellow is in the artwork on the cover. It's a comedy. It's got five words. It's a novella, et cetera. It meets all of those prompts. This is a humorous novella from 1932. It's a wedding story. Um, it is not easily available in the U.S. That is the downside, but it is on audiobook. So that's what I'm going, I'm going to listen to it on audiobook. There's also a movie out of it that's available for purchase and streaming and so forth. Um, but Cheerful Weather for the Wedding is the, is the book that everyone will be reading together, and there'll be a wider discussion of that book. What I have found so fun about these hibernation uh, retreats is that these prompts get you to shop your own bookshelves. Yes. So, and it's like a treasure hunt. Yeah, I've got to find a book with yellow on the cover. I've got to find a book with five words on the title. That was the hardest one. For some reason, books have four words or two words. They don't have five words. And um, it's it's really fun to, to reshop your own bookshelves and remember, th oh, I remember when I bought this book or I remember when somebody gave this book to me. I didn't remember, for instance, that a book that you and I have used multiple times in our own writing workshops, Natalie yep. Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones, has mm -hmm. yellow stars on the cover. Yay! So there's the yellow, right? Uh -huh. um, and I said, books finding books with only five words in the title is really hard. Fortunately, uh, Dexter, one of our listeners, recently sent us Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future. Mm -hmm. Five words. And so for the weather prompt, uh, it was, you know, find a book with the word weather or uh -huh. find a book that has a type of weather oh, in I, I do it in the one, title. I do want to mm -hmm. mention one thing. I, uh, there was a, a novella mm -hmm. and um, I went shopping for uh, John Varley. Oh, yes, uh, that's right. Got two novellas in a, in a book from uh, that's a yellowing paperback that I've been carrying it's, around it, for decades. It's old. <laughs> it's old. Yeah. Um, in the Hall of the Martian Kings is one of them, and uh, pers the Persistence of Vision is the other. But it was sitting right there on my bookshelf, and yeah. both wonderful. Um, one I think it was a Hugo winner or a Hugo contender, 
And but it's it really is. And you had a chat about that, like, oh, look, yeah. this this book, we're looking for novellas and science fiction novellas, because, of course, we're working on Science Fiction University, mm-hmm. our our other podcast. And so you're shopping your own shelves and you're pulling stuff out that you might have not have looked at for years. Mm-hmm. And so for the weather prompt, I pulled out a book that I just bought in January. Um, it's George Saunders book, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain in which four Russians give a master class in writing, reading, and life. That's the name of the title. Uh And that book, uh, it breaks down several classic Russian short stories page by page and examines why and how they work. And he's actually taking a kind of seminar that he teaches at Syracuse on on Russian short stories Mm -hmm. and teaching it in this book. And it is a delight. I I never took Russian literature in college, uh, because I thought it would be too depressing. <laughs> and it, it, it was, and it, it didn't was, matter. I did. It, it and well, I had a yeah. Russian teacher, my, my Russian teacher, um, uh, his wife, uh, I, I believe he mentioned, uh, there's several phases apparently that you go through when you translate Tolstoy. And ah. she, was, she was the last one. She was the one who sort of combed out the last details in Tolstoy. So he was, he was a great believer. And I, I, I'm sure I've told you this on this podcast before my job, was not to translate Russian into English because I didn't speak Russian. My translate was to translate his deeply Russian inflected English into English for other people. Ah, so he would stumble on a word, and uh, it's it, the Russian. It's a novel. It's a mimic, a mimic, you know. And everyone would stare at him blankly, and he'd look at me and go, "You're less." <laughs> and I would say, uh, "A mimic? Yes, yes, yes. It's a mimic. It's, it's a mimic." And you know, Vinnipu, Vinnipu. It's, 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 everyone knows Vinnipu. And blank stares. Winnie the Pooh? Yes, yes, this is Vinnie Pooh. Vinnie Pooh. <laughs> and that was my job in his class. So he yeah, and I, you know, yeah. and we were not quite in the same age range, but we were both grown ups and had, yeah. had had lives. And so we got along very well. And I thoroughly enjoyed his class, um, which did exactly the thing that we were about to do, which is take a deep, knowledgeable, page by page dive into classic Russian literature. Mm hmm. And, and it felt very. You said it felt very decadent. It felt to do incredibly that. Yeah. decadent because it was. It was. We weren't doing it for another reason. We weren't doing yeah. it in preparation for something or out of commitments to something else. It was because we're both writers and we're both professional writers and we're both readers and we both thoroughly enjoy literature. And you know, television is full of stories and a lot of them are good and a lot of them aren't. And this was being taken by the hand by someone who's really good at explaining things and really mm-hmm, good at literature mm-hmm. and knows the and subject. Lively. He's and lively. He's very lively at how he writes. And yeah. loves loves what he does, clearly. And taking us through, in, in this case, it was in the cart by Anton Chekhov. Um, in and the cart, yeah. In the cart. And, and diving very deeply into the craftsmanship that went into making it. The art of short story writing and, in general, how, how short stories work. And I've also been watching personally long form interviews with Rod Serling Mm -hmm. talking about writing for television and the frustration of trying to do anything new because TV wants McDonald's. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Something that gives the audience a predictable and reliable outcome, a a little tingle that's tweaked just enough every week to be enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So every week you have heroic doctors and nurses facing trauma in the world and their personal lives. And you have heroic cops and lawyers facing trauma in the world and their personal lives. (laughs) And there's a new patient with an exotic disease that shows up at and House's laboratory. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. in his search for the one-armed man, each week Richard Kimball evades Lieutenant Gerard while making new friends and helping people along the way. That yeah. went on for you know a decade. Yeah. Um, and those are those, some of those we really enjoy. You you love House. Yes, I do. And uh, I think it's a, a really good show. And I like The Fugitive, but it is a very specific kind of fiction designed not to be challenging mm-hmm. or to mm-hmm. be mm-hmm. Um, surprising. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the also, same ca- also house does not age well in the Me Too era. I have no, to say, no, no, no. It, it, he, it, HR would have had him out of that hospital yeah. in about episode three. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, so these yeah. are these are not things that we uh, don't love. Um, for example, you and I love The Mandalorian. Yes, we do. Uh, which is a samurai western, and but the plot is protect the child. <laughs> That's the whole <laughs> plot, and 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 but these are very much paint by number projects. And their quality depends on the, the the characters and the casting and the dialogue that the creator uses to fill in the canvas. And and great literature, as you talked about, is the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. You're not looking for predictability or reliability. You're looking at 
choices the writer makes to tell you something new, to tell you a story you've never heard before, mm-hmm. and and to rewire your brain while you're reading it. Uh, so it, going through this story, this in the cart slowly and consciously as to mm-hmm. how, what kind of decisions did Chekhov make in writing each word? Mm-hmm. Uh, you start to see the structure of the story, and uh, that does pretty much ruin mainstream media for you. <laughs> because... <laughs> it does. It does. It does. It completely ruins it. Well, it, it it's sort of like you're seeing the Matrix, you know? Yes, you can exactly. see that yeah. this stupid structure that we're all saturated by every goddamn day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, make, it makes me think of, you know, television network executives wanting to throw a baby down a well <laughs> at yeah. this point yeah. just to have some traffic just to have some attention again because biden is boring right. and we don't it's you know I, i've i've said in in crooks and liars staff meeting worth it worth it to not have donald trump on that podium you know mm-hmm. to have him at that lectern because i would rather give up the internet you know, give yeah. up blogging and so forth about politics and have it be steady and competent and mm-hmm. boring and get the job done rather than have drama all the time, which gets you gets you eyeballs, right? And you and I are political and cultural podcasters. We're experts in the field, really. And every week – Well, I we don't t- consider myself that. I just do it all the time. I, well, that's, that's, <laughs> how, <laughs> that's how you become experts at something. I guess so. Um, but, you know, as writers, you and I, I think, find it much more interesting and important to look at um, the intentions of the authors in those stories. Mm-hmm. And, and George Saunders talks about how every paragraph in a great short story should be doing two things, raising the stakes and moving the story forward towards its conclusion. Mm-hmm. Mark Twain talked about the writing as a series of promises. On one page, you make a promise to take your reader someplace. And on the next page, you pay off that promise by making your reader another promise. Another and, promise. And, and and Saunders talks about, you know, part of this is a contract with the reader. We I'm going to make you want to turn the page and read the next paragraph. Mm-hmm. And if if I can't fulfill that promise of you will want to find out what happens next, then I failed. And you're going to close the book and throw it away. Um but yeah, drawing your reader through the story is very important. Mm-hmm. And and the idea that in a short story, especially, there is nothing wasted. Mm-hmm. Every mm-hmm. word is sweated over. Every every position, every adjective means something. It has to because, or else you get rid of it. The idea is you get rid of the excess. You you cast out the the stuff that isn't moving the story forward. So as a reader, you learn to pay attention to everything, and mm-hmm. you notice the, the the references to a horse on page three. And how the the narrator or the the protagonist of the story refers to herself as a horse mm-hmm. and thinks of herself mm-hmm. as a horse, and you realize, oh, this is a this is a this is a great story. It's also a, a parable about people who make it through life mm-hmm. and people who working, get through working hard, working, working yeah. something they might not like doing at all. Certainly, something they're forced to do. People who have t- taken a great fall from from the class that they were in down to a level of poverty where they're still slightly above peasants, but not much. And they're doing a job they don't like, but it's important that that job be done, and they have the respect of the people around them. And it's a drag; it's dragging yourself through life, doing things that are unpleasant but necessary. Is not a story <laughs> that's going to yeah. be made into a twenty-part Netflix series, but it's a really good story. And that's the thing: if you pay any attention to mainstream conservative media, a uh, mainstream or conservative media, you will immediately notice that nothing like this is happening. Because the idea is not eliminate everything that is not efficiently telling the story. It is, oh, shit, I have an hour of cable news to fill. How much Mm -hmm. junk can I cram into it? Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. like for years, I have been regularly deconstructing David Brooks' weekly columns. David Brooks is an utterly static writer. Mm -hmm. He does not Mm -hmm. write newspaper columns, plural, in any sense of the word. He writes the same fucking column over and over and over again year after year. And in 10 seconds or less, as you and I used to joke, I could always find the razor in the apple. I think it's really important to talk about that for a moment, what the razor in the apple is, because what what he does is write about 
uh, humility, freedom, camaraderie, society as a whole, mm-hmm. uh, friendship, you know, all of these sort of very bland, generic, positive words. Right. And then, and that is the apple of his thing. I'm writing about humility. I'm teaching a whole course at Yale about humility and how it fits into our uh, building our social structure. How do we how do we reweave the social structure right, into right. a more dense network of blah 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 blah? Right, right. Which nobody right. can disagree with. That's fine. That's no, a great thing. No. Right, and that that is the part of if you're just reading it in a surface way. You can then tweet, David Brooks gives some deep truths here. Deep truths. Deep That's truths, what they man. are. Deep, deep truths. And you know what? Missing, friendship is important. Friendship, friendship is so important. Friendship is really important. I don't know if you knew that. Friendship <laughs> is really important. David Brooks has such insight, man. Let me tell you. Uh, and, then, and then, but if you look for the razor in the apple and, and explain what that is, what, the what is the, David, what his well, razor in the apple is. David Brooks has written in two genres during the time I've studied. And I, these are true genres. These are self-contained um, literary fictions uh, mm-hmm. with rules inside them. The first genre he used to write in when he worked for Bill Crystal at the Weekly Standard was liberals are terrible and everything mm-hmm. they think is wrong and George Bush is a genius and why can't stupid liberals see that? And oh my God, they're going to pay a horrible price once they're forced to admit that George Bush is right about everything. That's how David Brooks made his living until it all blew up in his face. It's like writing on the glories of the hydrogen zeppelin and how smooth it is and how awesome it is until it blows up in a fiery wreck. Mm -hmm. That should have been the end of his career. But he changed to a different genre. And the different genre is however awful, shitty, terrible, malignant Republicans are, Democrats are just as bad. So during the 2016 election cycle, David Brooks wrote a whole long column in which he said, and I just stripped out all the extraneous words, it was, Trump, Sanders, Trump, Sanders, Trump, Sanders, Trump, Sanders. Paragraph after paragraph, basically Donald Trump and, and Bernie Sanders are the same person. Bernie Sanders loses. David Brooks reacts, reacts by writing column, Trump, Clinton, Trump, Clinton, Trump, Clinton. Both sides do it. Both sides are always to blame. Both sides are always awful. It's the extremes on both sides. It's the tribalism of both sides. And it, that mm-hmm. really is the stuff that I've been writing about now for 16 years. And he also he also adds to that then the, another razor in the apple mm-hmm. on occasion, which is there is a magical time at which re- the Republican Party was wonderful. Yes. And let's wonderful. get back to that. They yeah. were wonderful. Back when Tom DeLay had just basically taken, taken his trench coat open and waved his big corrupt dick around when he was mm-hmm. you know destroying – any any pretense the Republican you Party mean kind of like Ron DeSantis is yeah. doing today, yeah, yes. almost um, exactly the same. Yeah, um, David Brooks wrote a whole column reacting v- aggressively to this corrupt, terrible person who's Republican by saying, "Well, we use a third party because uh, <laughs> there are the there are the Tom delays on one side and the net roots Tom delays on the other." Oh, there There's, are net roots Tom yes, delays. Yes, yeah. <laughs> And this was in 2006. You know, yeah, this is yeah. this is how far back the pathology goes. And mm-hmm. and he and I wouldn't again, I wouldn't deconstruct him. I think I chose a, a very good target because David Brooks has created not independently, but created an entire genre which are imitated by dozens of people across oh, the media. There are a lot of white meat men in the media who would love to compare themselves to that and, and hold them hold that up as the standard for for reasonable columns. You might in, recall. Uh, uh, All over the place, yeah. N- the guy who's now shopping himself at MSNBC, a gentleman named Matthew Dowd, who spent the entire 2016 election and the year afterwards saying, yeah. well, uh, yeah, sure, uh, Trump's bad, but what about those emails? And, and you know, this, what about the emails? And he was, and he insulted me personally for pointing out that both siderism was toxic and would lead to disaster. He insulted he my insulted readers. He insulted your readers. He did. Yes, you know, he people did. People who read Drift Glass are stupid. Um, you know, I'm a liar. And then when it turned out Drift Glass was right about everything, uh, suddenly he got Jesus because he quotes the Bible every goddamn day like Matthew Dowd <laughs> does. But he got Jesus. And this is the, the title of a post I'm writing called Immediate Republicans, mm-hmm. um, which mm-hmm. means in Medias Rest means a, it's a short story term, means in the middle of things. And all of these people have a very specific spot at which they start their stories. Mm-hmm. David mm-hmm. Brooks's stories all start like yesterday. <laughs> Yeah. There is no past yeah. at all. Yeah. And uh, Matthew Dowd, for all of the time he spent shitting on liberals for telling him that both sides do it was a cheap, horrible, dishonest, toxic form of literature. While he was the chief news analyst for ABC News, he now thinks both sideism is terrible. 
And yes, he right. only surrounds himself with people who will not ask him, well, isn't this the exact opposite of what you were saying back when you were working at ABC News? Back when Donald Trump was being elected president. You know, remember you and the Ron corrupt Fournier? The duopoly. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and what, what, what about that? And And he is protected because he works in a fictional genre in which the – Story began yesterday. And the, the establishment st- media, I think that's our point, is the establishment yeah. media is a fictional genre telling a story mm-hmm. that started yesterday. And that is why uh, Governor Cuomo doesn't have to resign, apparently, because mm-hmm. they are now there are people on Twitter right now saying, look, he's just going to ride this out uh-huh. because six months from now, everyone will look at each other, and go, oh, wait. That Cuomo guy, he didn't resign, did he? He's still governor. Oh, yeah. Well, and, we, we, and, we, we, we were busy with other things because we have to keep a fresh story every day. Mm-hmm. And it's like Francisco Franco is still dead. <laughs> if every day you have to report, Governor Cuomo still hasn't resigned, mm-hmm. right? Well, and, and you and I also, because we are experts in our field, um, mm-hmm. uh, every now and then uh, we'll reach for the remote and, and check out what's going on on Fox News. To, yes, to we do. verify that everything we believe is true is true. And so in the evening, when we do that, we find out what story they're telling. And it's always um, some minor variation of the exact same story. Always. Always. Is yep. it going to be immigration tonight or Joe Biden is senile? Oh, it's both. Oh, it's a special. It's a very special double feature on Tucker Carlson. Also, um, they're forcing us to do things that we don't want to do. Like they're they're telling Joe Biden's telling us who we can have over for Fourth of July. Right. And he's forcing us to get our get shots. Everyone at Fox News has had their immunizations. Don't yes. don't lie to yourself. The only person who's admitted it is Hannity. Hannity right. said so, and Hannity's the only one who gave you know air, any airtime at all to the fact that Donald Trump said, "Get your shots." Right. They spent six. The entirety of Fox News this week spent six minutes on that, and that includes the time that Donald Trump was on the air with Maria Bartiromo mm-hmm. saying it. Six minutes in between. They spent, the, go ahead. They yeah, spent oh, just, over it, an hour on Biden and him calling Republican governors, you know, Neanderthal thinkers. Well, and and this is where the writer brain, our writer brains, come in because someone, mm-hmm. some organization, is paying Tucker Carlson and David Brooks and Joe mm-hmm. Scarborough and Charlie Sykes and Michael Steele and Laura Ingram. Each of them are being paid to tell their own shitty fairy tales in their mm-hmm. own genres over and over again. Mm-hmm. There's no, there's no, mm-hmm. there's no stakes raised. There's no advancing the story. The story has no ending. It's just a constant repetition of the same parts of your brain being stimulated. So the writers in us skip over the part about the specific details of the lie they're telling today and get on to the more important question, which is what you get from analyzing literature, which is why, mm-hmm. why these kinds of stories are being told. What are the stakes? Since the stakes are never raised and the plot never progresses at all, what? are they for? What is the purpose of the story? I can tell you the purpose of Anton Chekhov's story. I can tell you why it was built and how it was built because I've now studied it in depth with a person (laughs) who knows what I'm talking about. So the question then becomes, what purpose is served by telling the lies over and over and over again? And it is simply to keep the audience in a constant state of rage and paranoia and feed their racism. That's it, mm-hmm. to keep them mm-hmm. in place, to keep them at That's the purpose you know. of the right wing media. Yes, mm-hmm. it is. So the, now, but what about the what about the mainstream media? What about same, CNN and, and MSNBC and NBC and Chuck Todd and all of that? They're telling they're telling the David Brooks story. Mm-hmm. They're telling the both sides do it story. The they're both telling sides the do it story. They're telling the and this I was listening to a, a conservative podcast today. <laughs> you know, I, and it was and, and you just wait for it. And one of their putative liberals on this podcast, which I, I shall not name, they were talking about some issue or another that's clearly the Republican Party is a fucking disaster. And it was, well, you know, I think what he's trying to do is on the right, you have these people who are telling these horrible lies about Joe Biden and and viruses and et cetera, et cetera. But on the left, you have these other people who are, and no one is specifically, oh, no, mm-hmm. it, was, it was immigration. You know, on the right, you have the, this horrible racism and this sort of thing. But on the left, there are some people who just don't want borders. I don't know who open those people borders, are. Open borders, yeah. Yeah, I have no yeah. idea who those people are because I've never heard a Democrat say open borders. But it is in, it is necessary to infer their existence and their power to justify the statement that. But there's a lot of people in the middle who think that <laughs> we should do the we should do the DACA thing, you know, the, yeah, the Dreamer yeah. thing, but not let everybody in, as if that's anyone's actual position. 
And that's the mainstream media lie. That's the lie that got us here, which is David Brooks and all the rest of these people are selling the same story, which is there's some imaginary liberal out there who's just as bad as actual Republicans. And we're talking to you folks in the middle. You know, you and I think that is a reinforcement of the power structure that makes oh, yeah. New York, New York City, L.A. and Washington, Rome, yes, you know, and absolutely. and keep your attention on us and we will sell advertising based on your attention. But be aware that the the reasonable analysis of what is actually happening in the world and what matters mm-hmm. is here. And you have to watch us in order to get that. Well, and, and and that commodification of not just news, but privilege mm-hmm. is uh, something that has to be broken down. Well, and, and the abolition, the absolute abolition of the past, mm-hmm. the past yeah. has to be destroyed. Because yeah. if you have people digging around even just months or years ago, what they're being told now by the same people makes no sense at all. There's no – right. it, it is – it, it, this is where, again, story analysis and sort of literary analysis makes sense because a story has to make sense from start to finish. And, you know, you can't suddenly have, unless you're, you know, the life of Brian, you can't have a spaceship land in the middle of Huckleberry Finn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and mm-hmm. it doesn't mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. So the story has to make sense from the beginning all the way through to the end. And the problem with the Republican story, the never Trump story, for example, is that it doesn't make any sense. They yeah. have to keep starting yesterday. Mm-hmm. Because if you mm-hmm. take it back, and and one example, for example, is the um, this this right wing domestic terrorist threat that we're now being told in the news is a real thing. We need to take it seriously and just look at the insurrection on January sixth. And there's a bunch of never Trumpers out there who say that's this is a terrible development from the Trump era, and the Trump era certainly did lead to all this violence, and we should take this seriously because this is a very bad thing. Um, you know, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the militias. And they're very worried about it. And here's a quote um, that has a trick at the end of it. Here's the quote. The report also said that the high volume of of purchases and stockpiling of weapons and ammunition by right-wing extremists continue to be a primary concern to law enforcement. And that attacks might come from lone wolf individuals. Now, here's the trick. That is not a quote from the report this month on right-wing extremists. That is a quote from the report from 11 years ago on Mm -hmm. right-wing extremists. And the same people who are now rubbing their hands together and, whoa, my God, the Trump has really done terrible things. And this all started in, you know, 2016, were the same goddamn people who were were saying, oh, this is just Obama. Obama targeting his political enemies. This is bullshit. And and you go back and read, and it's Glenn Beck. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's Roger Hedgecock, who you'd never heard of except outside the Stephanie Miller show. It's Powerline. It's Michelle Malkin. But all of these – and, of course, Fox News – but all these lunatics screaming, this is oppression, you're targeting the Tea Party, you hate conservatives, this is Obama's jackbooted fascist police state trying to, you know, trying to stomp on his political enemies. Mm-hmm. All of that was reported as part of the story. So CBS reports, on the one hand, you have people saying this other, but on the other hand, conservatives are very mad. So they, they bulldoze their way into a story that they have no business being a part of. And they, they do it as, well, here's the other side of the story. No, there is no other side of the story. Right-wing conservative terrorists are a domestic threat. They were 11 years ago. They were when Timothy McVeigh blew up the federal building. And this is not a conversation that anyone on the right was willing to have because it meant the problem was inside their party. Mm -hmm. They were the problem. Fox News was the problem. And the Tea Party was the problem. And Glenn Beck was the problem. And Rush Limbaugh was the problem. And they cannot admit that. So what they have to do is either lie about it which is what Fox News does, or pretend the story started in 2016 and that no one remembers that that there was exactly the same report more than a decade ago, which the right quashed, effectively blew off the table because they didn't want to hear about it. And had these same people had the, oh my goodness, the Republican Party is full of Republicans revelation that they had you know two minutes ago, if they'd had it back then when they actually had microphones and, and audiences and people on the right listened to them, maybe things would have been different. But they didn't. They just looked the other way and went along and and let it let it slide. And here we are now. So yeah. that's that's why starting the story is vitally important to people who want to lie to you. Because if you want to extend the story back, as we are doing right now, it's how is it that the same report on the same threat is being taken seriously now, but not 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 15 years ago? And the answer is, well, we were complicit back then. And now we we are we're good people. 
<laughs> and now yeah. we'd like you to all forget that, you know, Michael Steele was Rush Limbaugh's footstool. Well, uh, we want you to forget about Jim Crow, yeah. even though oh, we're yeah. doing it again and, mm-hmm. and again and again and again. Mm-hmm. You know, I the story this weekend on right wing media is going to be Joe Biden tripping on the stairs to Air Force One. Right. Completely ignoring that, you know, he's got a hairline fracture in his ankle that mm-hmm. we all know about. And also forgetting, you know, <laughs> Donald Trump can't walk down a ramp or has toilet paper on his shoe or can't close an umbrella mm-hmm. uh, on Air Force One stairs. You know, the the idea is, no, we're going to start right here, right now and blame Biden mm-hmm. for being uh, unable to walk. You know, well, the, the, the 25th Amendment. Hurry up. And, and you know, you, you were very clear about it being the right wing media. But here is a tweet from today. Mm -hmm. From Jonathan Lemire, who works for the Associated Press. This is the tweet in its entirety. President Biden, comma, who stumbled on the stair board on on the stairs, comma, boards Air Force One for a flight to Atlanta. There's no need for this stumble on the stairs portion of that sentence, other than Jonathan Lemire wants to be able to say, oh no, no, I'm I'm fair. I'm fair. See, see, he tripped. That's part of the story. And it is it it is you're right, it's Rome. It's the center of the empire. And, yep. and and again, until the the insurrection mob um, shows up, you know, in the in the at at Martha's Vineyard, and starts scaring the shit out of people who do programming on television networks, nothing's going to change because this is all a game to them. This doesn't threaten them. This isn't in any way dangerous to them. So it's we're right back to where we were um, in 2015, which is we're going to go right back to both sides. Do it. We're going to go right back to well, you know, the right is worried about caravans. So that's a legitimate story, right? So we're going to make the news go back to what makes the people in the middle comfortable, which is both sides are to blame, both sides are the problem. Uh, Mitch McConnell has a point of view, and 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 Chuck Schumer has a point of view, and who's to say which one's right? And it is maddening to me um, that we're going to have to read through the same stupid story all over again because the people who run the media are TV programming executives who want the same fucking tapioca, don't make them mad, just have them buy dick pills, news, um, that got us into this mess in the first place. Mm -hmm. Would you like to do a news round update? Thank you, Drift Glass, for all of that. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And we're going to keep... Snuggling up in bed and reading stories. So and you Russian can't literature, us. apparently, for the next yeah. next few weeks. Well, yeah. we are, you know, we, this is this is our Russian, Russian asset episode. So, <laughs> you know, yep. Well, and 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 apparently we've got some Russian assets in the Congress: Devin uh, Nunez and okay. Ron Johnson. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Matt Schlapp siding with Putin over Biden in terms of, you know, I think Putin would win that debate. <laughs> hey, I I remember um, long before. Uh, Donald Trump was president. We had a guy named mm-hmm. Barack Obama president. And yeah. I was getting um, bare-chested Putin riding a horse um, uh, graphics yeah. from yep. conservatives I knew saying, this is what a real leader looks like. This is what a real leader looks like. This is what a like. real leader looks like. These people – And it is, it is because Russians are perceived to be white. They're white and they're on yep. a horse and they, they're muscular and they don't fuck around and they kill their enemies because that's what strong forget, men do. They forget how much of Russia is in Asia, by the way. Well, that's uh, – yeah. <laughs> you know, that's but they, inconvenient. <laughs> but they want – I mean, Republicans – scratch Republican, you'll find a fascist. They, they want yep. a strong man. They want a white, yep. Christian, conservative strong man to order yep. people to – to respect them. Yeah. And that's what they saw in Putin long before Trump ever showed up. Exactly. And that's why they elected the who they did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. In national news, the Bidening continues. As we said, 100 million shots, 42 days early. And Biden agreed to send about 2.5 million doses of the AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine to Mexico. But what about the wall? Isn't the wall, what isn't Trump's the, finished wall in the how, way of that? I don't know how they're going to get across that uh, terrible, that terribly high, impenetrable. Yeah. yeah. Um, the announcement of the vaccine deal follows a recent call where Biden asked President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador of Mexico whether more could be done to limit the flow of migrants coming to the border. Today, Mexico announced that it will limit travel across its northern and southern borders starting March 19th and deploy sanitary control measures at both borders to slow the spread of COVID-19. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, Psaki bombed and said that the discussions over vaccines and border security were unrelated, but also overlapping. And I'm sure they were cordial, too. Yes. In a related story, 
The U.S. is also going to send about 1.5 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine to Canada. The CDC warned that the U.S. could see another surge, another surge in COVID-19 cases as states relax restrictions and Americans return to airports for spring break travel. Mm -hmm. I'm pleading with you for the sake of our nation's health, CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky said. Cases climbed last spring. They climbed again in the summer and they will climb now if we stop taking precautions when we continue to get more and more people vaccinated. Yeah. And I got to say that the commercials that I've seen for um, vaccinations, we mentioned this before, really are um, getting people's aunties on television, getting the people who are the, the one group I haven't seen any commercials appealing to or, or reminding are the, you know, the red bill diner dwellers. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I don't know what to do about that. Other than, yeah. you know, pray for their immortal souls and hope they get vaccinated so that they don't infect other people. The Senate confirmed William Burns to be Biden's CIA director. So they're gradually getting through Biden's confirmation slowly but surely. Yes, they are. Uh, the Senate confirmed Xavier Becerra as Health and Human Services Secretary, the first Latino to head the department. The vote was 50 to 49. Susan Collins was the only Republican to support Becerra's nomination. Uh, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas testified that the U.S. border is secure and the border is not open. In a hearing being held by House Homeland Security Committee, Mayorkas defended the Biden administration's approach to creating a fair and humane immigration system, despite the administration's struggle to accommodate a surge in unaccompanied minors at the border. It's a problem, and it, it's a problem, and it will be a problem until we get our immigration system fixed. And it is not, this is the thing that, I'm just going to do a sidebar here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is a, tr a genuinely complex problem. What do you do yes, it is. with families are rejected and they, they're sent back and they send their children because they want to save their kids. And so you have a flood of, of unaccompanied minors coming to the border. That's a human tragedy. That's mm -hmm. not an invasion. That's a human tragedy. That, that is what I hope you or I would do if our backs were against the wall and the only way to save our children was, would be to send them to a better place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Unfortunately, and how hard that would be, and hard, and hard, and complicated, and heartbreaking, yeah. and tragic on on all counts. The problem, of course, is that none of the complexity or human tragedy or or reality of the story of a wealthy country bordering a poor country mm -hmm. is going to make it into Fox News. Right. This is no. just a bludgeon to try to beat Democrats to their knees. That's all. It well, will be. and and it's connected to the illegitimacy of any Democratic leadership. Right. On the Fox News side, mm -hmm. automatically Democrats are illegitimate. They're illegitimately elected. They're illegitimately leaders. And anything they do is bad and wrong. Right. And so and, and then combine that with the absolute racism of Fox News. Which, when one person from South America crossing the border into the United States is illegal, immoral and wrong. And, and as a, as right? a sidebar, I mean. You know, Oh, you know, as a sidebar in our in our literature discussion, mm -hmm. um, the the hand wringing I hear from the the Lincoln folks and the Never Trump people that I do keep track of about, well, it's sort of baked into the cake that Republicans are are as I call them reprogrammable meatbags. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter how complex or true or false right, right. Fox is just going to lie to them anyway. Right. And right. and here's yeah. what Democrats need to do to thread that needle. And you know, and I'm, and I'm like, you know what? I'm perfectly willing to have a tactical conversation with you about how Democrats can best cope with a crisis you created. But mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. I would like to start the story back around 40 years ago. And let's talk about how these people came to be reprogrammable meatbags in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to mm -hmm. hear about your complicity in that and why you didn't see it coming and how you lied about it for decade after decade after decade, which makes me not want to trust you. That is mm -hmm. a much larger and more fruitful conversation I would love to have. But that is not a conversation that anyone in on the reasonable right wants any part of. Yeah. Because it involves acknowledging that what we are asking Democrats to do is to clean up a catastrophe we created, and we still want to sit in the passenger seat and bitch about how they're doing it. And that is not a uh, recipe I'm comfortable with. I do not want people who created the problem harping on me and kibitzing with me about how I'm fixing the problem that they caused. And that's all I hear when I when I listen to Never Trumpers talk on mm -hmm. television. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In the good news department, Democrats are getting back to doing what we do best, raising taxes. Uh, 
The White House is expected to propose a number of federal tax increases, and let's just call them what they really are. Federal tax increases on corporations and the wealthy, the first major tax hike in almost 30 years. But here's the point. To fund key initiatives like infrastructure, climate, and expanded help for poor poor Americans. The tax hikes would be included as part of an infrastructure and jobs package and would likely uh, include uh, repealing portions, wait for it, of Donald Trump's 2017 tax law, which benefited corporations and wealthy individuals. Yeah. Well, and you know, the modern monetary theory folks are going to take issue with that. And I, the the more I hear from them, the more I realize this is their era because they are everything that is happening now is proving them right. Yes. And that you can spend and the government prints money and it's not inflationary at this point in our economy. And, uh, the the tax increases aren't necessary for rich, but but I think on a moral yes, and political exactly. Exactly. angle, it is necessary. It is necessary to to sh- prove a point that wealth inequality is wrong, right. and so that's that's why to do it. Uh, an inspector general's report found no evidence to support a Pennsylvania postal worker's claim that his supervisors had tampered with mail in battle- ballots during the presidential election. This was a claim that Lindsey Graham and other Republicans have repeatedly cited in making their baseless claims of voter fraud in the election. Uh, Representative Jimmy Gomez, who's a Democrat from California, spoke on the House floor this morning on his resolution to expel Marjorie Taylor Greene from Congress. Quote, I take no joy in introducing this resolution, but any member who incites political violence and threatens our lives must be expelled. I don't see how that's debatable in any way. Nope. Matt O'Blog uh, says, our friend Steve Bennon, one of the things we learned just this week from the intelligence director is that part of the disastrous Trump COVID response is that Trump put in a key COVID response role one of the people who helped Russian intelligence with its 2020 election attack. Uh, a dozen House Republicans voted against awarding congressional gold medals to the three cops who saved their lives and defended the U.S. Capitol when it was attacked by the pro-Trump mob on January 6th. Several of the lawmakers objected to the use of the term insurrectionists in the resolution, while others objected to the use of the word temple to describe the Capitol. That's what they said they objected to. Yeah. 21 Republican states attorneys general sued the Biden administration for revoking the Keystone XL oil pipeline permit. Several of the states aren't even near the proposed pipeline path. 21 Republican states attorneys general did something else. I'm dying to know if they're the same states. They threatened to take action against the Biden administration over the $350 billion set aside under the coronavirus stimulus relief to help cities and counties and states pay for the cost of the pandemic. The law as written says that you can't use the money for more fucking tax cuts, which the Republicans characterize as, and I quote, the greatest invasion of state sovereignty by Congress in the history of the Republic, which I kind of thought was Sherman's march to the sea, but apparently not. And then what if we've already planned to give a giant tax cut to our donors and corporations? You're stopping us from doing that. (laughs) You you monsters. You're all monsters. I've got an idea. Don't take the money. Yeah, don't take the money. You you don't want to put people on Medicaid? Fine. You know, just financially secede from the U.S. government. And let's see how but that also, works. And, and, and we talked about that. The, yeah. the Republicans in Texas, the GOP official Republican Party statement in Texas and doing this whole Texit nonsense mm-hmm. right before the deep freeze. Uh-huh. And, oh, we want to do Texit. We want to ri- a vote on Texit. Right. And it's like you have 62,000 people on Medicaid in nursing homes mm-hmm. in Texas. It's the second largest population. In, me- in nursing homes on Medicaid, dependent on federal government dollars mm-hmm. to for your life. Next to California, you're the sec- Texas is the second largest population on, in, on Medicaid in nursing homes. And you want to secede from the federal government. Yeah. yeah. No, I, you don't. You're bullshit artists is yeah. what you are. Uh, yeah. We want to complain about it. We want to complain on why. Because mm-hmm. that's what Texans are famous for, being whiny, complaining <laughs> little bitches. Yeah. Texas Republicans certainly are. Mm-hmm. Uh According to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, Vladimir Putin authorized operations to interfere in the 2020 election 
by conducting an influence campaign aimed at denigrating Biden and the Democratic Party while supporting Trump, undermining public confidence in the electoral process, and exacerbating sociopolitical divisions in the United States. You know who didn't try to screw around with our elections in 2020? China. Which means that when Bill Barr said under oath that it was China and he knew it because he'd seen the intelligence reports but couldn't tell Congress the details because it was classified, he was lying. He was lying. And, you know, I know it's a radical notion, but mm -hmm. he really go to jail for that. He really could go to jail for that. Um, other people who should go to jail, and if this turns out to be true, because um, it looks a lot like the 2018 FBI quote unquote background check of Brent Kavanaugh might mm -hmm. have been a fake, might have been faked, Blue Gal. And I know this is another time which The Daily Show predicted this. Like mm -hmm. that week, they said, this is all baloney. I mean, there's no way they're, they, it did an investigation in a week and didn't talk to Brett Kavanaugh. That's not right. a real investigation. Senate Democrats introduced the For the People Act, a comprehensive voting reform and anti-corruption bill that was passed by the House earlier this month. Chuck Schumer said proposals to roll back voting access in several Republican-led states smack of, they don't smack of Jim Crow, Chuck. They are Jim they Crow. They are Jim Crow, yeah. Smack of Jim Crow and represent a threat to democracy, which would be countered by the legislation. Yeah. Um, in local news, you don't often get Trump news that's local, uh, but the vaccine has been withheld from the hospital that gave Trump Tower residents shots. Uh, the city of Chicago has decided to withhold the first doses of COVID-19 vaccines from a hospital that improperly administered vaccines to Trump Tower workers. I'm sorry, workers. Uh, the withholding of vaccines comes as the city conducts a review of actions by Loretto Hospital, whose president admitted 72 restaurant, hospital, and other support personnel at Trump International Chicago were vaccinated earlier this month by hospital workers because you got to have all the amenities when you live in Trump Tower. And if we have to cheat... And he lived in Trump, Trump Tower. Mm -hmm. This hospital president lived in Trump Tower, so he made sure his neighbors mm -hmm. had shots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, and all, and this was for the workers. So all the workers, all the support staff, all the people who provide I mean, people them... People that were bringing him him his meals yes. or whatever yeah. from the well, restaurant you know, all, the all people had their that shots. Make, and make it a luxury hotel. Uh, mm -hmm. We're all taken care of ahead of uh, everyone else. And mm -hmm. that's uh, that's just... And that that we would have seen four more years of that. If the other guy, oh, yeah, you know, I, oh, he yeah. would have been selling Absolutely. the stuff off the back of a truck to the highest bidder. I still think I want to know where Jared put those 90,000 uh, vaccines that are apparently missing at the end of the Trump administration. Yeah, I got it. I don't want to turn that into a conspiracy theory, but I think there was some selling to, you know, friends and allies in other countries. Yeah. Cough, cough, cough Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um. So I, you know, I want to know about that. Maybe, maybe. Citizens for <laughs> Ethics and Responsibility in Washington will add that to their list. Yeah, it's, it's a it, yeah, guys. Could could you get right on that? Because get right on that. Tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> They're very busy over there. Very busy. Yeah. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is a dog. This dog is named Kit, and Kit is a very lovely companion dog. Kit. We'll sit with uh, the people that are sewing masks and help them out and give them advice on sewing masks. He guards against neighborhood Visigoths, and uh, he has a favorite podcast listening spot in the house where he sits and listens to podcasts like this one. And of course, Kit Eats Freshly Poured Pet Food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store direct, your pets will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Kit, who is a beautiful dog, at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your Internet Kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. And don't forget, we are planning a letter show. Whether yes. Drift Glass has anything to do with the planning or not. I... Memorial Day weekend is our 600th show, and we will be doing a letter show that weekend. 
Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, hot or iced, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. We've got PayPal, Patreon, our, our emailing address, and our postal address information. It's all there. At proleftpod.com, we've got merch. You know, there are tank tops and all kinds of summer wear at our uh, merch button as well. And please share our show on social media. Thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, I'm not sure about the Internet Kitties, but I do have two questions. First, where are goddamn stimulus checks? And second, why has the UPS truck delivered three truckloads of cat toys to our house since Wednesday? Hmm. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.